Hi, everybody. Welcome to SoCal Loopers. And we have a real special guest today, and I'm very excited. Uh, please welcome Aaron Kowalski. He is a type 1 uh, diabetic. He is a looper right now on tandem, but he was a, a DIY looper for many, many years. He is CEO and president of JDRF International, and he'll be talking to us today about loop and the future of artificial pancreas and any questions you might have pertaining to loop and technology futures. I will we'll go through our regular disclaimer. Uh, the loop is a do-it-yourself closed loop algorithm and user interface developed through the work of community volunteers. While it may seem obvious, please consult with your healthcare professionals regarding your diabetes management. Remember, please understand that this project is highly experimental and is not FDA approved for therapy. Therefore, you take full responsibility for building and running your system and you do so at your own risk. What I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of a background of Aaron today. Aaron Kowalski is the first ever JDRF CEO living with type 1 diabetes. It's kind of about time, and it's wonderful. And there was a wonderful uh, interview with Aaron um, by Mike Hoskins on Diabetes Mine, and I'll just give you the quote. Not only because Aaron is one of us in the pancreatically challenged tribe, but also because he's highly respected among the patient and healthcare communities, med tech industry, and regulatory and policy spaces. He's like, all those places. He's seen as a powerful advocate and game changer who brings a personal diabetes connection and passion to everything he does. He was diagnosed at age 13 in 1984, so you can figure out how old he is. Um, he's the second in his family to be diagnosed after his younger brother, Steve, was diagnosed several years earlier at the age of three. He holds his PhD in microbiology and molecular genetics. That's a handful to say. Uh, with a focus on complications and hypoglycemia research. He was an early advocate of CGM technology and closed loop systems, and in 2006, he helped create JRF's Artificial Pancreas Program. He's been instrumental in pushing for advanced technology, open source protocols, and efforts to move beyond A1C outcomes in clinical research, more efficient regulatory review, and improved policy making. It's everything we want in one human being. Um, he's been very involved in testifying before Congress, U.S. Health and Human Services, and the FDA, as well as numerous national and global authorities. He also, in his spare time, is an avid runner who's completed 18 marathons and probably by now more than that. He loves to play golf and ice hockey. He's the leader of the JDRF Peak Program, which is performance and exercise and knowledge, providing for the first time guidelines to help people with type 1 diabetes exercise safely. So I'm going to turn this over to Aaron. I thank you so very much for coming to talk to with us and please enlighten us. Thanks so much, Joanne. There's nowhere to go but down from here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, seriously, it's a, a real pleasure to talk shop with people who really care and are living it. And uh, I'll give a little intro. I have slides that I may throw up here and there. But uh, so, Joanne, um, I appreciate uh, all you're doing here. I wish I could uh, be out in Southern California, particularly as our cold weather starts coming. Um, I hope everybody's staying safe. I'll give you a little bit. You heard that uh, I'm the first CEO at JDRF with uh, Type 1, and I'm, I'm proud of that. I, I think the voice of our community is obviously important. JDRF has been historically more of a parent-driven organization. Now, I think now you see the broad spectrum of people at all stages of the disease represented, and, and that's hugely important. Uh, I, I was diagnosed, as you pointed out, when I was 13, my brother three. Uh, and maybe I'll just start with a little intro, kind of uh, how we got here, because my career at JDRF kind of really, I think, shaped uh, some of uh, the tra trajectory of closed loop systems. And really, it was my personal experience. So go back in time. And my brother, Steve, who lives right down the corner, uh, right around the corner from me, and uh, we're very, very close. He uh, was diagnosed first. 
And this was back in the days of urine testing and uh, uh, animal insulin and has really pretty profound hypoglycemia awareness. So growing up, uh, Steve had a lot of uh, severe hypoglycemia, uh, many seizures, many ambulance trips, many hospital trips, nearly died once. Uh, and it had a profound effect on our family. So I went to grad school. My background is in molecular biology and wanted to get into diabetes. And lo and behold, JDRF job popped up. And the, you know, the amazing fortuitous kind of thing that happened was we have a staff of scientists. So for folks who aren't familiar with JDRF, we obviously fund research and we have scientists who oversee that. Now that's what I was hired to do working on diabetes complications. And this is where the beginning of the story of kind of uh, piecing together devices, I think, begins, uh, for, at least for JDRF. People were working on this, obviously, but I was assigned to work on hypoglycemia. And of course, that was a passion of mine, given the personal experience. And in um, October of 2004, got to go to a meeting. We collaborate a lot with uh, NIH projects and there was a group called DirectNet. And they were beginning to do some trials looking at hypoglycemia prevention. And I went and I was to participate as the JDRF representation, uh, you know, make sure we were all coordinated and whatnot. And there are this group of doctors and nurse coordinators and they're all wearing these devices. Now, here I am, a multiple daily injection guy. We're still obviously finger poking at the time. And I said, what are you guys, what is this? And they said, it's a continuous glucose monitor. Continuous glucose monitor, what do you, what do you mean? And what it was, was the first test, uh, this was pre-FDA approval, of the Abbott Navigator. And uh, I was so jealous that the next morning when we woke up to go to breakfast for the second day of the meeting, all the type one doctors and nurses were saying, look at this, it actually works. It's tracking our blood sugar. And picture back then for the folks who weren't, for the folks who weren't there then, um, or even if you did have type one back then, the, the predecessor to the, the navigator was the Medtronic CGMS and the Gluco Watch. So DirectNet had tested the Gluco Watch and it was a pretty catastrophic failure. And the CGMS system was a retrospective system. And boom, here's a navigator. So the beginning of at least my story in devices was coming back to JDRF and saying, guys, you are not going to believe this there's a CGM device that actually works. And this would open up, you know, this huge potential to start to go down a road to really reducing hypo, et cetera. <laughs> the crazy thing was back then, we didn't do devices at JDRF. It was all cures and cures and cures. Uh, there was complications, um, was our treatment portfolio of research. So they said, well, we don't do this. And I said, what do you mean we don't do this? We're trying to prevent hypoglycemia. Well, the companies do that. And long story short, I met Jeffrey Brewer, who was on the board. Many of you know him as the CEO of Bigfoot right now. And he and I conspired to start the JDF Artificial Pancreas Project. And, and we can go through some of the kind of the the crazy trajectory of how we got to looping and all the different amazing steps that came between then and now. But that's the beginning of uh, at least my, my device uh, uh, experience. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll pause here because uh, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting story, the little steps that happened in between. Folks said, uh, Joanne, if you wanted to jump in or if you want me to push forward. You push forward. We're, we're listening. I do remember when there was a panel on the 2007 on the upcoming CGM. Yeah, and, yeah in Orange um, County. I remember it well. I, I remember all of that. Going, and I grabbed my husband and said in a very gravelly voice, I want this. And it's the same feeling as I need to have this. 
Um, and um, it was very exciting. So yes, please move on. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, okay, I'll push forward because it's, it's fun reminiscing about this stuff. Um, so what happened next was we, thanks to Jeffrey Brewer, who made a big philanthropic gift to get the project off the ground, got a green light to push forward. And the idea was CGM could transform hypoglycemia, but the problem was CGMs were unproven. The clinical community didn't believe in them. There was a lot of skepticism. You know, if you go back, back in time, I was part of one of the original dream beams of for some of the long timers. Um, I literally participated in a dream beam study in gosh, 92 or three. I was in uh, an undergrad and research uh, student at Rutgers. So, you know, people had seen all these failures, dream beam, non-invasive, dream, uh, Gluco watch. And we, we kind of said, okay, this navigator looks like it's working. We went out, Jeffrey and I met the team at Abbott. We actually went down, met Medtronic team. And then we met the Dexcom team. Dexcom was just transitioning. Uh, many people don't remember this, but or, or again, they were an implantable sensor company initially and just transitioning to a sub-Q sensor company. So we were trying to get a handle on this seems to be working. Okay, what's the pathway forward? So um, we, we set out one side of the equation was we want to see CGM succeed because it seems to be working. It just needs to be, uh, have a fire lit under it. Then of course, if CGM could work, kind of this holy grail of tying the CGM to the pump would be possible. Al Mann and Medtronic were doing that with a implantable system. And then kind of the other thing that was happening is we were funding some research at Yale that was using the Medtronic CGM, the first gen uh, real-time sensor with uh, Bill Tamberlain and Stu Weinzimmer, the doctors at Yale, great friends and amazing doctors, and Gary Style, uh, a scientist within Medtronic. And he and they were generating data that said this could work. So we created two programs and uh, got going. And I'll just kind of then start to lop off very quickly what happened because it's a, it started to go really quickly. We started to push on a variety of closed loop approaches. We funded UVA and a group in Italy doing model predictive controllers. We funded... Um, so Glenn's asking about the UVA study. So one of our first groups, we had five initial groups, the team at Yale and Medtronic, uh, the team at UVA who partnered with a group in Italy, actually two groups in Italy, Dr. Damiano in, in Boston, um, uh, Roman Havorka in uh, England, and who am I forgetting? And Stan the team at Stanford. So, and Santa Barbara, UCSB. So algorithm development, what's the right algorithm Medtronic was using, what's called a PID algorithm. The other groups were using model predictive algorithms. We got that going. Gosh, the CGM worked. We funded this big trial, the JDRF CGM trial. Boom, the results were amazing. Published in the New England Journal. I, I remember I was the very first Dexcom user in New Jersey uh, when Dexcom got approval. Uh, and the, the closed loop trial started generating very positive data. We then went to FDA because FDA was super hard back then and they were reticent to even approve, uh, again, fast forwarding quickly here, the um, first step in the closed loop, which was the threshold suspend pump by Medtronic. And back then I published a paper that you may see floating around uh, here and there on a roadmap, six steps to get to closed loop. And um, I'm proud of that because it really shifted the mindset of, do we need to be perfect and create a beta cell or do we, or an islet, or can we lop this problem off in stages? And um, that really changed everybody's focus to what we would call hybrid closed loop right now. Whereas back then, everybody was trying to go after a fully automated system. So we then went to FDA. We said, there's a pathway here. We want you to create what's called guidance. They refused to do it. 
So we did it ourselves and presented it to FDA. And in 2012, that guidance was published. So the company started going. And what you saw was Medtronic going. Um, we funded a project at J&J &J with Animus, uh, Insulet. Um, we worked with Roche. Uh, Tandem was just coming into being. As you know, Tandem started out as a dual hormone pump company. So we were looking at dual hormone with Tandem initially. And uh, hence the name Tandem. Uh, so, uh, th and this is where the DIY stuff starts to come in. So you could imagine what was happening back then was there was all this promising data coming along, yet the companies were, it felt kind of glacial. They weren't moving fast. And lo and behold, one day in my office came in a friend and he said, Hey, check out what I did. I, uh, I hacked the Dexcom. I'm watching Sam's glucose on my phone. And I said, what? It's unbelievable. I'll, I'll never forget it. I was in my, my office in lower Manhattan. And uh, that was Brian Maslish. Uh, as far as I know, the first person to do that. And we then started this kind of side. There are these people who now the word got out that the Dexcom was hackable. And you mentioned Joanne, that I was a runner. I introduced uh, Brian to uh, a friend, uh, Lane Despero. Um, Lane and I connected when his son was diagnosed and he jumped from uh, GE to Medtronic. We started running marathons together. Um, yeah, and, and those guys were frustrated that they couldn't get the data off the systems and they didn't want to wait for uh, the companies to come along and do it. So JDRF kind of then started having this weird kind of dual world of my working with the companies to try to accelerate regulatory approved products. And I remember vividly going out to uh, Thousand Oaks, California, where Lane and his family live. And he said, uh, you've got to check out what I built. Uh, I call it a night scout rig. And um, we, we, uh, uh, obviously then learned that he could start to display and it created obviously this Night Scout movement. Um, you know, lots and lots and lots of action happened in between there. And obviously Brian then um, hacked the Medtronic pump. I think Brian, uh, Brian's a very close and beloved friend of mine. There's some people uh, unfortunately throw some darts at him because he didn't release that code. Um, he, he, he was working on it. He felt, you know, in fact, we, we, we talked to the FDA about it. We talked to legal counsel. Everybody advised uh, that it wasn't a good idea to do. Um, but of course, the word got out that the pump was hackable. Ben West, as everybody knows, came along and um, Dana and Scott up in Seattle. And uh can I, jump, can I jump in for the quick yeah. question? You were at JDRF at the time? Yep. And JDRF was just coming into their position on the DIY, as I remember, because we set up the first build in Orange County, and Lane came out, uh, the whole Night Scout team came out, and the, the word came from JDRF in the morning, you can't have this meeting. Um, and we were putting people on Night Scout. We put about 14 people on the, the rig. Uh, yeah. How did that, did that ever change at JDRF to let us talk about DIY? You're in that position. You're yeah, there. it's so interesting how difficult that was because essentially what we were getting from our uh, legal regulatory people and the FDA was we do not like this. We don't feel comfortable with it. It's not, it's, it's, it's a gray area. Obviously you're allowed to do it for yourself. Brian Maslish, when he did it, when we talked to the FDA people and our lawyers, they're like, you can do whatever you want to yourself. The challenge is if you're marketing it. And this is where, you know, these kind of the workarounds happened. The challenge for us at the time was, 
we were just being advised that it wasn't a good thing to market. We could get into trouble. Um, and now it's, a, it's always been a, a, a little bit of a tricky situation for us as we work with FDA quite closely. And, I, and, and honestly, FDA was very uncomfortable with this at the time. Um, FDA was, you know, FDA tends to be conservative and I'm not going to knock FDA. FDA became a tremendous partner of ours. And I always say they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. It's a hard job. Uh, so they, you know, use their pathway of clinical trials and demonstrating safety. We all know that living with diabetes, and in fact, if I, uh, I should share my screen and show uh, some data. Um, 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 um. Yeah, this is a, a we all know uh, that um, <laughs> life with diabetes is not so simple. I always show these. Um, so I always show this when, when I would talk to FDA. This is a slide that we funded uh, at Stanford in the Barbara Davis Center. You know, this is uh, showing people back in whenever this was, 2015, 14, who were on pumps, on CGMs, in a clinical trial at two of the premier centers in the world. And the reason I always show this slide is not, be, you know, the system active when the algorithm was working, reduced hypoglycemia a lot. That's great and awesome. But why I would show this to FDA was, you know, you guys think this is safe now? It's not. And these data, if you look carefully, what this trial did was measured uh, this, you know, predictive low system overnight. And if you were in the control, it meant that the system wasn't working and you were just doing it on your own. And look at how many nights people spent a lot of time below, over two hours below 60. 8% of the nights for these kids or 5% of the nights. It's 11% of the nights for adults. So the, you know, so I think the balance that we were always working with with FDA is, guys, we're, we're in a situation where people are on a razor's edge every single day. Yep. And what happened is FDA, as these data came out, as Night Scout um, uh, uh, and, and then ultimately uh, uh, OpenAPS and, and um, uh, Loop uh, just gained steam, um, I think, if, and, and, and the CGMs obviously got better. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to unshare. Oh, here we go. Stop sharing. Uh, FDA became more comfortable, but in the beginning, you're right. It was a hard, fine line that we were walking, trying to drive innovation, but make sure that we kept an open dialogue with FDA. Well, we we often think about um, moms and dads of little kids. And they are the algorithm. Yeah. And they're tired and they have other yeah. kids and they have jobs. And how could anyone look at uh, a computerized system that actually doesn't get tired and think that that's worse? I, it's, it's challenging for us. Well, I think the, you know, honestly, the, the, the original concern was with the older sensors that had errors that could cause the algorithm to overdose insulin. That was the worry. Yeah. And what those years in the beginning of the project, the JDRF funded artificial pancreas work we did showed is there was some risk, but the risk on the other side is much, much, much greater. And that was the other thing about having some you know, not controlling down to too low of a target back in the olden days when the sensors had a little more inaccuracy is we allowed for like that, the paper that I published, the whole idea of this six step roadmap came from kind of two things. One is how are we dosing insulin when a CGM is ringing that somebody's severely low? That's the dumbest thing in the world. It's telling you you're low, you're passed out, but we're going to pump insulin into you. Yep. There's no risk of turning the pump off. Mm -hmm. well, okay, let's get that approved. And then the other step that I argued to FDA and to the, our research community was, 
when we did the JDRF CGM trial, nobody really understood how much time in ranges people spent because we were doing finger poking at the time. So when we got the JDRF CGM trial data, it was the biggest data set at the time in the world on how much time do you spend in range, low or high a day. And the average person in our trial was spending over 12 to 14 hours a day above 180. So my mathematical side of my brain said, okay, if we're worried about an error driving somebody low, just set the set point higher. And if somebody's spending 14 hours a day above 180, what if we could make that seven hours a day? That's pretty good. Yep. And that's where the hybrid closed loop stuff started it was, okay, you can have inaccurate sensors and it doesn't have to be uh, a subjective debate with FDA or doctors, we can quantify risk because this is all number based. And, uh, and you know, the rest is history. We've moved forward aggressively and here we are today with hybrid closed loops. So the question that has come up a couple of times is why would you leave the DIY? Why would you do that? Yes, yeah. So that's a good question. So let me talk about getting on DIY, my coming out of the closet, uh, and um, why I've switched to Tide Pool. So I went on to Loop. Well, if I was still on it, it would be, I guess, five years this coming up. Uh, it was right around Thanksgiving. Uh, it was the day after Thanksgiving. Um, so I think it would be five years this year. I went up relatively early. I wasn't the, the, in the first batch of people, but um, I'm close friends with Brandon Arbeiter and Howard Look and Brandon was on our board, JDRF board, and he showed me his loop and I said, oh my God, I've got to do this. So uh, I went on loop way back with, with Brandon and a, the original crew of people and um, it was life changing. And I instantly saw that, you know, all the stuff that we were funding and I was hearing about and vicariously living through, I could experience. And I, I, I talked to my brother. He quickly got on. It was transformational for somebody who has these low problems, even with CGM, you know, with rapid dropping blood sugars, Steve would still get low sometimes. So that was a huge advance. And I finally, I said to the team at JDRF, um, one, I can't, I have to think of my, my health and my family first. So I'm going to do this. And then, you know, I thought, I can't, I can't, I'm an honest person. You know, people can ask me questions. I don't, you can ask me anything tonight. Uh, I'll tell you an honest answer. And I couldn't go and hide it. So I said, I, you know, if FDA has a problem, they can talk to me. I, I have to think of my health of myself and my family first. And it really opened up my eyes to this balance between that FDA thinks about, which is FDA thinks of a big population of people of all sets, skill sets and intelligence and et cetera, and kind of the ability of somebody to take some of that risk into their own hands. What is the balance between innovation and ownership of some risk? And I think it really opened up our eyes at JDRF to, to push even harder, that uh, to have the discussions with FDA and, and really where we saw a big pivot um, is I challenged the team. And I think Mariana, uh, one of our, when our, our regulatory people is on uh, the, the call, I said, guys, I think we should be pushing for interoperability here. I think we need to bring DIY above the table, make it widely available. And I, I asked the regulatory and DC teams to look at every single option, legal options, uh, regulatory options, um, and come up with a game plan where we could accelerate that, that we didn't have to use old Medtronic pumps or hack into the pumps. You know, all this work that went into, you know, cracking into the, the Medtronic and Insulet pumps, we had those communication codes back in 2008. You know, 
the research FDA world. So instead of spending time on that, why aren't we spending time on more algorithms and features and stuff? Why can't we just make this more available? Okay. And that, um, uh, you know, was the last four plus years at JDRF. So why did I go on to Tandem? Um, I went on to Tandem because I thought it'd be interesting to try. Uh, I had worked with the UVA team for, well, since 2005. I knew the intense amount of work that went into the algorithm that's under that hood. And uh, I wanted to see how it worked versus loop and what the pros and cons were. So uh, I went on, I think, December of last year, and uh, we can talk about my experience. Were, were you coming off of a pod or a Medtronic? I used Medtronic my entire looping career. Okay. I, I switched to the pod two days after it was made available for the comfort of knowing I wasn't with um, a very old pump. It, that, was, that was frightening, always frightening that I had a 13-year-old yeah. pump. So I would imagine for you making that switch is you have an actual pump from well, a company. Well, my brother was soldering the pump at one point. I mean, so that's another uh, – certainly, I'll tell you, my battery cap cracked, and I had to do everything I could. Like, I would be – I travel – I used to, before COVID, travel all the time. And – I remember being in a hotel once and I, I changed the battery pump was just dead. You know, so those kinds of worries are stressful. And, but you know, I, I, uh, that wasn't my driver. My driver was just curiosity and wanting to, I like to try and be able to talk the talk, uh, I walk the walk behind talking the talk. And, uh, that's why I did it. Uh, there's a question that came in saying, uh, were you able to find a, an endocrinologist yeah. or provider to see you while using the DIY loop? And if so, did they actually understand well enough for what you were I, doing? Yes. Uh, uh, I've seen the same endocrinologist for a long time. And I'm in a unique position, I guess, because he knows what I do. We talk shop a lot. Um, and he kind of, you know, of course he's working with me and coaching me and, uh, helping me, but he's pretty flexible in terms of me uh, asking to try new things and being willing to listen when I am doing new things. Like Glenn and I uh, were talking about using a Frezza and hybrid closed loop, and we, we can get into that a little bit if folks are interested. I said, hey, I want to try a Frezza. Okay, well, you're kind of one of my trailblazers. Let me know how it goes. And I'll often give feedback about my experience and how I feel about things. And he trusts that I'm a responsible type one person who, you know, is, is pretty uh, safety conscious. So uh, I, I, but, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm also of the ilk of Jeff Hitchcock. Everybody knows Jeff from CWD. You know, Jeff is such a big advocate for you have to be your own advocate. And if your doctor is not doing it, you've got to find somebody who's willing to listen. So for the folks who aren't finding the support from their clinicians, I think uh, that's where you need to push. Um, and I know that's sometimes harder set, uh, easier said than done, but um, I'm always uh, a big advocate for myself when I want to try new stuff. Yeah, we, we find that to be a significant problem. Um, I think what, what a lot of us are finding is the endocrinologists look at our clarity reports. They don't want to see anything else. And they go, oh, yeah, pretty good. And that's, <laughs> about the end of that discussion. Um, uh, go, go back to something you said just a little while ago about, because uh, it never occurred to me that the FDA actually knew all the inner workings of all these pumps. Um, and yet we had to hack, not we, the programmers had to hack. I just get the benefit of it. Um, did that frustrate you knowing that the information was there and yes. Hugely. you were not allowed to have it? Hugely. Um, and I, again, I understand because FDA, now I think this is an, a, a concern that's blown out of proportion, but they are concerned about medical device safety and hackability. Uh, and that's, that's fair. Uh, I, I remember going to a talk, it's got to go back to like 2013 or 14, and somebody had demonstrated they could uh, 
hack uh, the Medtronic pump after, you know, many people have done it. And this guy, he got up and said, you know, this is a real threat. Somebody could come up and uh, give you too much insulin. And I said, man, if I'm worried, or like a terrorist could give you too much insulin. I said, if I'm, if I'm losing sleep about a terrorist overdosing myself with insulin, I've got more problems than my diabetes. Um, so, uh, but, but ultimately, FDA doesn't like the idea of people hacking into medical devices. And I think we probably we would much prefer that you just had a pathway to do this uh, uh, that, that had uh, all the safeguards that was controlled by you, but it was frustrating. I remember so many people who wanted a pod solution and we had been testing pods in our closed loop trials for years. Uh, so, you know, and this is where, again, our interoperability initiative with Tidepool and the companies is really trying to break down those barriers and allow for that innovation on the front line with the safeguards that make the device manufacturers and FDA more comfortable. I, I totally agree. Um, I remember talking to the chief medical officer at Insulit about three years ago and said, let us in, just help work with us. And it was just a hard no. And and it couldn't have been a fear of using their device. It would have certainly increased their market share. But along those lines and, and some of the things we've heard, do you see uh, devices wanting to shut down our access um, as we go forward? No, I don't think so. I think they're just worried about things like, uh, like, malicious hacking, uh, not the stuff that the, the, this community is doing. Um, I see the companies, so again, if you think about the, the, the gauntlet that was thrown down to the team at JDRF, and I give this team a lot of credit, they have done so much work behind the scenes. Most people don't think of the regulatory and policy teams as trailblazers, uh, the JDRF team, but they did. I mean, that, that AP guidance and a lot of the reimbursement work on CGM really helped save the, 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 the pathway and access for, for many of these things. So in any case, I remember I was out in Colorado at one of the Barbara Davis Keystone meetings a couple of years ago, and I was with David Panzer, the Helmsley trustee, who's a great friend and partner. I convinced him his daughter should loop and this, he's public with now that she's been looping for a long time. Um, and we sat down with one of the FDA uh, leaders in this space and we said, Courtney, we really need to think of a pathway to interoperability. How can we do this? And we sat and we brainstormed and we brought together a bunch of people shortly thereafter. And what I, I think the companies love the idea of because what it's going to do is, I think, significantly break open the market. Meaning, if you look at how many people are on pumps right now, 35% in the US or so, you know, the cost to develop a closed loop system was very high for Medtronic and Tandem and Insulet is going through it right now. In the future, if you can get your pump certified and just speak to a certified algorithm, the cost is going to drop dramatically. And I, JDRF, where we're focusing a lot of our energy is this interoperable ecosystem exists now. So once you have more components that can plug and play, I think the companies are going to be driving it because we all know that this, this solution is far superior to doing shots. Like, I can't even fathom going back to shots. Like, you could do CGM in shots versus pump in shots, pretty well, but you can't beat hybrid close up. You can't do every five minute adjustments. So what I think you're going to see is people as they can pick the device that works for them and plug it into an app like Tidepool Loop. You may not know that Cambridge in England has a closed loop system that's on the app store in Europe that communicates to the Dana and the Roche pumps already. So now you're plugging and playing and pretty soon it'll be the Abbott sensor or the Dexcom sensor. So 
I think the companies see this as breaking open the market. I think, you know, the big question was Medtronic because Medtronic had a proprietary whole system, how that would affect their business. And you've seen that Medtronic has signed up to be part of Tidepool Loop. So I, I see this as the future. That, that's really encouraging. Uh, so I'll, I'll come to the question that came by. Are there any updates uh, that you'd like to share about Tidepool Loop or um, anything that's going on with that that you can talk about? Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know what I can say publicly. I can tell you I was on the phone with Howard and Brandon, who are very close friends and awesome that team is just so awesome. I, I love working with them. And uh, Actually, Brandon's going to come talk with us. Um, and if you tell us, we won't tell anybody. <laughs> I can tell you they are pushing forward aggressively and making amazing progress. And our goal, you know, our initial goal pre-COVID was to have this on the App Store this year. And I don't know if we'll be able to meet that lofty deadline, but they are – they have generated a set of study data that is massive and it's compelling. So I have full optimism that they're going to make it and it's going to provide an opportunity to start to plug and play devices. And, uh, you know, it won't make the DIY community go away. I think it'll just allow, like I see some of the questions in the chat about doctors and access it'll just broaden and make it easier for the broad community versus kind of some of us who love to live on the front line, uh, more accessible. So uh, yes, JDRF, you know, this is a big project that Helmsley and JDRF are funding and uh, our expectation is we're going to have this out there soon. So do you assume the DIY is out here, the uh, tide pool loop will be somewhere in between where Tandem comes in, and I don't know where Medtronic lies because I don't understand them. But um, is, is that kind of, if you want the cutting edge, you go to the DIY. If you want almost the cutting edge, you go to tide pool. And then if you want uh, safe, you go to Tandem. Well, I wouldn't say say I think, I personally think uh, these systems have been demonstrated to be very safe, uh, all of them. Uh, I haven't seen any reports that say the DIY are less safe than the traditional system, so I don't want to... Or from the point of view of your, of your doctor. <laughs> well, I am, again, the doctors are often looking for that clinical trial data, and you know, we've, I think the DIY community, led really by Dana uh, Lewis, has generated a lot of data that, that shows it. But I think to your main point, which is the bleeding edge is going to be the DIY community. The ability to make modifications in real time and add features and, you know, it's just amazing how fast and, and, and because you're living it and you can do that, you're just going to be out in front. Um, so I think your characterization is, uh, is, is pretty dead on. I, I hope what we're going to see is tide pool loop in these, the, the control part of the system, that there'll be more and more. The tide pool loop is going to blaze the trail. I'm, I'm actually anxious to try the Havorka system. For, for, again, for folks who don't know this group in Cambridge, England, Roman Havorka is an amazing genius, a mathematical savant and the data coming out of his system, similar to the UVA system, is just incredible. So what you're going to be able to do is whether it's Tide Pool, whether it's Pavorka, whether it's UVA, um, Type Zero, um, start to plug into these intermediate systems. I think the companies will always have their kind of bread and butter. Hey, open the box and it works. You know, people like that. It's like it's 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 you take it out of the box and you jump on the bike and you go. Tour de France people aren't doing that, but the average person prefers like, you know, a, a trek. So, um, and, and I think that's good. My philosophy is the more solutions we have for more people with diabetes, the better. Okay, so along those lines, uh, as a question, as Medtronic pumps um, that are loopable die off and Dexcom eliminates the Eros pods, does that essentially kill off DIY solutions? 
I, I never doubt the integrity of this community. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I doubt it. Um, I doubt it. Um, I think the companies will have pump, pumps that are uh, much more difficult to crack, but I think there's going to be a variety of solutions out there that people can control. And, and we are seeing a, a fair amount of flexibility in, in Europe and Asia that's, that I imagine people will figure out ways to get their hands on. So I expect that there'll be a DIY community. And again, just like you started out, this is an experimental system, but you know, uh, like I did at JDF, I said, I have to do what's best for me and I'm not going to go out and market this, but I'm going to do it. And uh, so I'm, I expect there'll be a DIY community. That, that's really comforting to hear. There was a question a little while back about how you might compare your results uh, between the tandem and the loop. Yeah, I am. Uh, I don't have uh, hard data in front of me to show you, so I'll just give anecdotal data. I think many of you know the uh, De Simone has written about her daughter's experience on loop versus um, uh, tandem. I would say my initial feeling about tandem was it was hard for me to give up the amount of control that I had with loop. And some of you probably have heard. Um, um, Jeremy Pettis talk about this. Dr. Pettis has given a few talks about looping versus uh, tandem. And both of us, we talked right at the beginning. We said, God, can't use the phone. Can't set the settings like we want. Blah, 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 blah. The interesting thing is, as a, a few weeks went on, kind of felt kind of good. And I almost kind of backed off of my diabetes. I would say the algorithm is very, very good for almost all of the things I do. I would say the one area that I still struggle a little bit with is the exercise, particularly I like to golf and do long walks. And I, uh, I think, you know, I like to long run. The inability or the, you know, the inability to stay in closed loop mode, but modify my basal rates has been a little bit of a frustration. Um, you know, that the set point change for exercise mode is kind of good, but not where I think it needs to be in the future. But my control is better, is the bottom line. And I think that has to do with the sophistication of the algorithm. Uh, so the, the pros and cons would much rather have it on my phone. Um, uh, the inability to set set points and modify is a weird kind of pro and con. Um, the, the exercise functionality, I would prefer a little more control there. Uh, you know, honestly, the not having a Riley link in my pocket, helpful, not having red loops. Um, you know, it's working. It's working all of the time if I have a Dexcom signal. So I don't have those dropouts or things of that nature. Um, now it's been a year since I've been on loop and I know that uh, the, the number of new revs that have been made, but uh, you know, it's, a, it's been a, it's been a great experience for me. And I think uh, would I jump back to loop? Yes. I'm going to poke around and do what you know, works in my situation, but tandem, I have no regrets. It's been a, it's been a good experience. It's, uh, we, we have a member, system, honestly, we have a member, um, on tonight in the middle of the night in Germany. Um, and she says that, uh, I was talking about the Dana RS. Um, and do you, do you think that will come to the US? We've been working with the team at SOEO uh, for a number of years. And I've talked to their CEO um, about this. Roman Dvorka used that pump in all of his original trials because it was one of the first Bluetooth enabled pumps that we could get our hands on. And uh, again, I expect that the pathway that FDA has uh, 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 carved out for interoperable pump sensors and algorithms will allow more companies like Sawheel into the US market. Because before, it was really, really hard to compete. 
You needed to have these partnerships. You needed to do expensive clinical trials. Now you just have to make, make the ACE pump designation. And that's pretty straightforward and not so expensive, uh, relatively speaking. So I, you know, JDRF has been working on a number of projects with the innovative, smaller, cheaper pumps. You know, cost is an issue. And as we, as we all know, so the more competition, we believe competition is good. It drives innovation. It drives prices down in, a, in, in, in normal market economics. We could argue about that on kind of the drug prices these days. But uh, so I hope to see Sawil, and we've been working with them for years, and I hope to see them on the U.S. market. Is, is there room in this market to let them in? Of course. I mean, that's nice. You know, I think the interesting thing to me about closed loop and automated insulin delivery, I get a lot of like Wall Street investors who call and ask to like get, you know, my opinion on stuff. And I remember back in the day, this is going back to like 2009 or 10, they would say to me, is there room for CGM? Will there a CGM ever be widespread? Are you, I said, are you guys crazy? I mean, this is a no brainer that this is the future. No brainer. And if you don't get on now, you're, you're, you're foolish. So similarly to me, um, you know, I have a slide, I'll show you another slide that I often use and it's very simple. Um, uh, let's just show this. To me, uh, this slide is one, whoops. Oh gosh, I should show you guys some of these funny slides. Um, oh. Sorry. I, mean, I haven't Where seen this in years. Oh my goodness. Uh, so I, I, I'm just gonna flip through these because I, I think people- I really love the guillotine. To remember <laughs> how far we've come. No, the first test tape, urine glucose testing, you know, when we talked about CGM accuracy, I, I used to say, CGM accuracy, or if you remember the Lancet sword, you know, the original finger strips, they were color-based. I mean, we were talking about 80 or 120 or 240. I mean, come on, guys. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the blue brick, uh, but, you know, this group, the pictures of this pump, so for folks who don't remember, this is one of the first insulin pumps made by Dean Kamen, auto syringe, and... Um, the original people who did this in the first publication, there were two publications in I think 78 or 79, John Pickup in England, Bill Tamberlane and Bob Sherwin at Yale. The original hybrid closed loop study that JDRF funded that was published in 2008, Bob, Bill Tamberlane. I mean, amazing. You know, I went to Dean, Dean we work with Dean still. This, is, this cracks me up. Um, this was one of the first uh, Baxter pumps. Check out the marketing on this. The Ugly. <laughs> I think that's the best, the best name for a pump. You know, who gets euglycemia? I mean, you got to really be inside baseball to understand a Ugly stands for euglycemia. But Dean has a, uh, a display at his company, DECA, in, in Manchester, New Hampshire, of all of the original insulin pumps uh, that they built and then uh, the ones that were originally commercialized. Um, Biostatter, the first closed loop from the 70s. Um, I just want to show one slide by getting back to, uh, oh, so this, you know, uh, coming back, is there room? You know, to me, this is a simple kind of thing that I often talk to researchers and companies about where they come up with things that they think are great but they're only fixing one part of the equation. So I always say that you can work on glucose, but life with diabetes is more than just glucose. There's actually life, you know, we actually live, we don't just do diabetes 24 hours a day. So the question then becomes, okay, well, how much do I have to take away from my life to get a better glucose? I could poke my fingers 50 times a day and get better A1C, but I'm stealing away a lot from my life. And I think that's been a very simple concept, but hard for many people who work in the industry to understand. 
And the reason I think that there's huge upside on closed loop systems is to me, these systems are the first treatment for us that do both. They make your blood sugar better and take away tasks. Katie DuSimone used a, a phrase. She said, I use less mind share. And all of us know that we think about diabetes a lot. So here, you know, my quality of life is better. My wife's quality of life is better. My kids, my brother, his wife, my parents. So, and the glucose is better. So take that and talk to somebody who's doing shots and finger poking. Are they going to continue to do that? Sure, there's going to be some people who always are resistant to change. But we have a treatment that actually does this. It works. We can all testify. We're the evangelicals out on the front line. But it's true. So now you have 1.6 million type 1 people in the U.S. We think that there's probably, I don't know, um, 400,000 or 500,000 on pumps. So there are 7 million people on insulin. Why can't type two people who are using insulin benefit from these technologies? Uh, I think there's a huge upside and particularly as the form factor gets better and the sensor gets smaller, the, these miniaturized pumps come to market, it gets cheaper. I think you're going to see significant room for expansion. Are, are we large enough market for that? I always wondered about that. Absolutely. The, you know, Medtronic is, Medtronic, my understanding is the diabetes franchise is about 15% of their total business. It's been a profitable business. XCOM, they're killing it. <laughs> Libre, right. Tandem. Now, as soon as that predictive Tandem system came to the market, you saw their uh, shares rise. And we're talking about the U.S. market. I mean, there are so many people impacted by diabetes all over the world. And as these systems demonstrate the value of reducing the risk of severe hypoglycemia, reducing complications, I, I expect you're going to see, just like CGM is exploding now, you're going to see these systems being more and more and more widely used. Okay, so I'm going to take you down the, the future path um, in CGM and in pump technology. So let's start CGM, um, MARD of 8%. How much better can it get? And is that on the horizon that you see? Yeah, I actually think that this, the sensors will certainly get more accurate. They're building in redundancies and ways to, to knock out some of the causes of errors. Um, I actually think the, the, the real action is on miniaturization. Um, you know, the sensors now in these loop or tandem or Medtronic or Insulet or whatever the system is that's coming to market are driving really good blood sugar levels. So I think the barrier is less on accuracy of CGM, more on, you know, our focus at JDRF is infusion sites huge part of the problem of getting consistency, uh, miniaturization, breaking down the barriers for people to want to wear devices, um, expense I brought up, making it cheaper. And then the other thing that we haven't talked about at all, I saw one person ask about a Freza. It's just, you know, the, the role of better insulin or other hormones like Dr. Damiano is doing glucagon uh, we have a group in, in Montreal doing um, both glucagon or a parallel pathway with amylin. Uh, you guys are in SoCal, so you remember uh, Similin and the company amylin. Uh, and our focus, at, again, at JDRF is, can you make these easier to wear for more people? Mm -hmm. Could you take away the need for mealtime bolusing? And, uh, you know, Dana... Lewis will claim that she does pretty darn well without mealtime bolusing. I eat a lot of carbs and I, I find it impossible. So um, I, uh, I, I actually would put CGM accuracy low on my list of things I'm worried about. And I think it's naturally just going to be part of the competition the companies are, are working on. So JDRF is not even really in that game. 
And are you thinking implantable CGM? You know, the implantables, it's interesting. I, uh, we had a couple people in the office at GDRF get uh, Eversense sensors, um, and a few of them raved about them. I mean, a reliable six to one month to one year sensor starts to become pretty interesting. So I was a little bit of a skeptic. I know the team at Eversense. We actually funded some of the original grants that created that sensor, which is pretty neat. Um, and again, my, my feeling is let's provide people a variety of solutions and allow them to pick. Just like I've never really um, liked wearing an Omnipod, a ton of people would never like to wear a tubed pump. I think some people don't like the idea of getting an implantation. And if you had a very small sensor that's changed every two weeks, that's not such a big deal. But I think ever since has shown that it's viable and that technology is very accurate, very accurate, particularly in the hypoglycemic range. So I, I like it and I hope that they keep the company going and uh, can get some foothold. So on, on miniaturization, that question had come to me before you even started. Uh, where do you see patch pumps coming in? I know there's someone working at UCLA with the micro needles. Um, yeah, we've been working with a number of companies on miniaturized pumps, and there's a couple things. Uh, you, you, there are technologies that will allow for miniaturization, certainly smaller than we're seeing now. The, we've been working on concentrated insulins because if you had a concentrated, you know, the, one of the big barriers is just the volume of insulin and how do you package it to take up as little volume as possible. That obviously affects the algorithms and particularly the absorption, sub-Q absorption. But we do think that you can get these, the pumps smaller and that's an area that JDRF has been funding. So let's talk about the insulins. Um, so, Lumjev, uh, Fias, uh, faster insulins, more concentrated. Where, where, where do you see that in timeline? Yeah. So we obviously have seen a few come to the market, and I think, you know, a big question whenever the insulin companies ask us, they're like, "How fast is, you know, do we need?" I said, "Well, we know what the body does." Now, I know sub-Q, that's hard, but faster is certainly better. Fat, we always say the, the, the head of the research at JDRF, I originally hired him way back over 10 years ago to work on faster-acting insulins. And we always say faster on, faster off, faster on, faster off. If we had a light switch we could flip on and off, diabetes would be pretty easy. Turn on my insulin, turn it off. Computer does that? You know, you're, you're riding in the, in the normal range all the time. So the challenge is if you talk to insulin chemists, sub-Q delivery of insulin is really hard. And getting really faster insulins has turned out to be a huge challenge. The fast insulin out there right now, the super fast is a Frezza. And the question, I, you know, Glenn and I talked about my use of a Frezza. I love a Frezza. A Frezza is super fast on and super fast off. Now, the problem is now you're carrying a, a Frezza and a pump, but, you know, it, it is very physiologic. And if we could get that type of physiology in a pump, wow, we would really, really be driving tight control and it would be transformational. So this is an area of focus of ours. I'll give you a, just a crazy anecdote for like one of the uh, really cool research projects that you, many of you may not have heard of. So we fund uh, two different types of insulin research, faster acting and glucose responsive, so-called smart insulins. And there's a very, very smart researcher who we funded initially at MIT, he's now at the University of Utah, who's been working on uh, glucose responsive. His name is Danny Chu, it's genius. Well, on the side, there was a researcher there working on um, snail toxins. And I don't know if you guys have heard this story, but it's an incredible story. So she was studying these sea snails 
that um, secrete different toxins. And there's all different types of toxins and they feed on different things. Um, but the type of snail that she was studying, which I think is found in the Philippines, eats fish, free swimming fish that swim by it. And it paralyzes them with this toxin and then eats them alive. And, uh, <laughs> and I always joke when I talk about this is it's, it's, I don't know if it's funny or not funny, but I find it strangely funny is <laughs> The fish that are paralyzed are actually hypoglycemic. They discovered the insulin, that insulin is the toxin. And this has actually become a really interesting research prog prog project for us because think about this. This is a snail. We all know snails, they, they're slow. Fish are fast. And it is paralyzing live fish in open water with insulin. So this is, you know, so there are innovative ways that we're looking at and they are looking at the molecular structure, which is very similar to human insulin and saying, hey, can we take advantage of the changes that this snail somehow evolved to make that it's super fast acting and super potent and trying to then say, could you make that into an insulin that we could put into our pump? Without paralyzing us. Uh, that's the, the, you know, I think these are hard problems, but we're, we're trying. So let's talk about a Frezza. Um, how do you account for that in your pump? Or did, how did you do that in loop? And when yep. do you use it? Yep. So I don't account for it in my pump. And they, you know, mentally, at least for me, the idea is the food and the insulin that I'm using with a Frezza is intended to be a wash. Just like, it's like a, you know, so it's like your perfect bolus. Okay, I'm giving a unit because I'm eating 15 grams of carbs. And if I'm doing it over here and they match up, it should not affect the system in theory. And my experience has been that that's pretty, pretty much the case. Um, you do have to be careful on the high side of correcting with a Frezza, which I like to use a Frezza for if I've, totally blown it and not bolused or whatever and in high and it will come down not to double up on your insulin if the system's been giving you insulin but in in normal meals i'm just not telling the system i'm eating i use it a lot for breakfast meals because i often eat carbs in, in my breakfast and it's generally where i get my biggest fastest spikes um, I use it a lot before exercise if I'm going to want to eat before exercising because I know I can wait for about 40 minutes and it'll pr pretty much be cleared out of my system and I won't have a tail of insulin causing me to drop unexpectedly. So I use it for um, carbs correcting an exercise. Um, uh, and it's been, it's a, it's a great weapon to have in the arsenal. Uh, I keep it in, you know, in my car, in my backpack, in my fridge. And uh, if I need it, I'm just like, Phew! and it's just, a nice, it's just really helpful. Do you, do you know that there's any better inhalable ability because it does, can make you cough? Are they working on improving the delivery of that? I don't know that. Um, I do know that they're working on pediatric uh, trials. Um, because that's been a point of pain that parents uh, can't use it um, or for their kids, but uh, different formulations and coughing. I'm not sure if they're focused on that. So you keep it in, in your backpack. Do you keep it on refrigerated or not so much worried about it? You know, I'm a, uh, my, my PhD was in protein biochemistry. And again, this is my, not a Frezza's, this is my experience. I'm a big believer if something's lyophilized, freeze dried like a Frezza is, that there's a lot of stability there. So I don't worry about it. it my, I do keep my, my, my storage in the fridge. Uh -huh. I, I, have a, I have a fridge space for that. But if it's been in my backpack for a while, uh, I've not had issues with insulin potency. Oh, that's great to know. Um, I just switched to LoomJev and now I'm playing with throwing Fiaspin so it doesn't burn so much. Have you tried LoomJev? Have you played? I haven't tried the LoomJev. I've tried Fiasp. Um, so I don't have personal experience uh, with LoomJev yet. 
Okay. And what was your experience with FIASP? No, I, I went through a round of FIASP and I, I didn't see I didn't see noticeable changes, to be honest. Um, I didn't see any decreased performance or issues, but uh, I didn't see, uh, I didn't quantify this well, but I didn't see noticeable differences, like in a Fresno where I can puff that and it's like, two right down. Um, so, I mean, the data is the data. It is certainly faster. There's no doubt you can do controlled experiments and the peaks are, certainly shifted to the left. Uh, so I'm certain that it's faster. It's just, I think, you know, we're talking about timeframes that may be just, you know, we, uh, ultimately I would love to see more. Do you, are there others being worked on that are inhalable that you? you uh, I don't know about it. Well, there is one inhalable. Um, um, gosh, how am I forgetting the company? Um, that'll come to me. And we've been funding some really interesting work. So one of the scientists that we, we fund is, is one of the smartest people I've ever met. His name is Michael Weiss. Uh, he was at Case Western Reserve, worked on some of the original insulin analogs at Lilly. He has some really innovative protein chemistry ways that he's looking to make faster acting insulins. He's focused on glucose responsive and thermostable insulins. So we, JDRF, have not given up on innovative ways to drive faster insulin action. Uh, just again, when you're delivering it through your skin, it's just hard. Uh, liver targeted, that's another really interesting uh, area of focus of ours. You know, Al Mann used to say part of the benefit of a Fresa was that it gets into your liver faster. And that makes a lot of physiologic sense to me. So liver targeted insulin is another area that we're interested in. And could that provide some buffer on the post mill spikes? That's interesting. Um, we did have a Mark Estes come and talk to us um, about capillary biomedical and um, how soon do you see those newer infusion sets coming through? Yeah, well, people probably know that, and this is a big disappointment of mine. We funded a really exciting project with Becton Dickinson it actually made it to the market and FDA cleared. It was a great set and then they pulled it. And I don't know if they've ever fully explained why they did. Um, and that was a huge disappointment to me. Huge because the infusion sets today are not good enough. Mm -hmm. I say that with all due respect to the companies, but we all know it. We all experience challenges with infusion sets and they're not good enough. So um, I'm not sure if it's public what Capillary is saying, but this is still a priority for me at JDRF. And it's, it's very, very frustrating to me. Very frustrating because there should be more work that's happening here. And um, We've talked to Convitec, the big company in uh, Denmark that makes many of the infusion sets. We've urged the companies to invest. You know, the challenge for the companies has been the margins on these sets and the pumps, they would, will tell you are, are too small and investing in uh, the sets, it gets deprioritized to in investment in things like uh, algorithms and next gen systems. And hence JDRF being in the space, trying to spur some of the innovation. But it, to me, it can't come soon enough. I think uh, longer lasting sets, better insulin absorption, less painful insertion. I, I, there's a, just a ton of room for improvement here. I just thought I'd give you the heads up. We can go for another four hours. I have a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> so there was a question about the dual chamber pump and the, the glucagon second chamber. Um, how do you see that fitting in? And do you think that will be revolutionary? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I mentioned that we fund, funded Dr. Damiano way back in the beginning. And it's interesting, he and I have had a healthy, friendly debate about this. Um, and I'll give you just my, my what I see is the challenges. And I think everybody sees these as the challenges. It's just the question is, 
and we're all trying to figure uh, how easy will it be to address them. So the first is just chronic use of glucagon. Uh, we haven't used glucagon chronically. We've used it as an emergency uh, rescue drug. People with type 1 diabetes actually still make glucagon. It's kind of a misconception that you completely lose glucagon production. You have dysregulated glucagon. And I think that's, a, that's been a question. You know, Xeris, um, they're, they're, which we've, we've been funding these liquid-soluble glucagons, knowing that we need something that's stable in the pump and that can be part of one of these systems. So Xero is coming out with their emergency version. Uh, Dr. Damiano has been working with a company called Zealand uh, over in uh, Denmark. So that's one question is getting approval to get, get, get things dosed uh, um, uh, uh, chronically. I think the second big and the biggest question now, Dr. Damiano and I used to argue a little bit about the control theory behind glucagon because I worried quite a bit about the, the desire to give more insulin, knowing that you have a rescue over here and what happens if the rescue doesn't work. You take off the pump, you're glycogen depleted, you're, you've had alcohol, which can suppress glucagon. Um, I, I like the idea of glucagon as a rescue, meaning like our, uh, there's a doctor named Remy Labasso, uh, Rabasa Larey in Montreal, um, who's been studying glucagon in closed loop as well, they do an approach which is insulin, insulin. It's essentially insulin alone with glucagon in rare instances when you get low, not a yin and a yang like your alpha and beta cells do. Um, but again, Dr. Damiato's data is amazing and, and we shouldn't discount, and I'm not in any I'm very much pulling for beta bionics to pull through. So, so the real question I think will be, frankly, what is the incremental benefit of having glucagon in there? Because what we're seeing is rates of hypoglycemia and all of us who are on loop or whatever system you're in can go on your report and see how much time a day are you getting low? Most people I know are below 2%. So the question becomes, how much lower can you go? And will an insurance company cover a more expensive system? Because you're adding two drugs instead of one. You know, so if you're getting low 1.5%, will an insurance company cover 1.25%? Is that enough? And I think that's the, the big question. So JDRF, I, I'll tell you, we, we're working to generate data. I do think that there are absolutely going to be people who benefit from this. And we all know that you can get low. You can overdose insulin and still get low. You can exercise. So in a perfect world, I think a dual hormone system makes amazing sense. The, and, logic, the logic of it is, I use the analogy of driving a car. You have a brake pedal and a gas pedal when they work together but i understand what you're saying about the percentage well i think the the analogy that i used to argue with ed about was you have to make sure the brake pedal works first and uh i think they've demonstrated convincingly that they can i i personally i like the very conservative approach they're a little more aggressive but the data is the data and they have and we'll have tons of data to show that their system is much safer than what people are doing right now. So then the question is, you know, how much better is it than insulin alone? And does it justify an additional premium price? Because we all know right now we're fighting for every friggin' device and thing that we get in our diabetes lives. And if it's more expensive, the payers will fight it unless the data is really there. So I think it'll be really interesting, like comparing a tandem system or a loop system uh, to a dual hormone system. You know, the other interesting thing that a lot of people don't talk about, but I'm, I think the other dual hormone is amylin and insulin. And that's the group in McGill 
have done amazing, and UVA actually, amazing studies showing that amylin and insulin could be a very, very powerful combination. So remember that amylin, the hormone, people with type 1 diabetes don't make anymore. It's a beta cell secreted hormone. It suppresses glucagon and it affects gastric emptying. So remember, if you took Similin, anybody who took Similin, it made your stomach hurt if you took too much. But we were doing it like, in my, my mind, like we used to do shots when we did them two or three times a day. Totally grossly out of physiologic range. And if you do it in a closed loop system, Similin blunts post meal spikes. So think about lowering the post meal spike and using less insulin it means that you are less likely to get low. And I think there, there could be a very interesting role for glucagon and insulin. And then we hope and we're funding research that is trying to get that pathway to the market. But I, I actually am really, when I think of the challenges of faster acting insulin, well, what if you didn't need a faster acting insulin? What if you could mix amylin into your insulin in a one vial pump and you didn't have to bolus and you used half as much insulin. That's pretty interesting. And now you're going to get low less. Now you're going to, so that's a big area of focus. And we're actually funding work on co-formulation of insulin and amylin because the companies working on that see that as a closed loop drug as well as a type two drug because it has positive weight benefits as well. So very, uh, dual hormone has a lot of interesting stories uh, still to unfold. Does Simlin ever come in a long acting so you could take a shot of it a day and it would have baseline? Not uh, Simlin. Um, uh, you probably know that the, the GLP class of drugs, which have been used primarily by type two people, now have week, once weekly, um, different mechanism of action. These are uh, working at the, late, le, the, the beta cell um, level. But um, our belief, um, and if you talk to the original amylin scientists, uh, uh, the, they firmly believe this, that if you did a pumpable version of amylin, you'll have much better results than the shots that we did back 10 years ago. So we have been funding research. The data is very good. Uh, and I, and, and I guess the last thing I'll say is you can use human regular insulin in the co-formulation. So both the insulin and the amylin are off patent, which provides a pathway to a potentially, um, mar I think, a, a reasonably priced marketable drug that, uh, you know, from a payer perspective could be interesting. And they don't bind to each other, they don't. Well, the interesting thing about the story here is the, the biology, the protein biochemistry of amylin is such that the buffer has to be, um, the, the, the co-formulation is not so easy, that it's soluble at a different pH than the current insulin analogs. So that's where we've had to do a lot of hard work is to get them both in the same solution. There are some companies who we think can do it now. And I think that that's another dual hormone approach. So I expect three years from now, you'll have a whole slew of insulin alone approaches. Hopefully you'll have a glucagon or a few glucagon and insulin, and you may even have an amylin and insulin approach. Okay, I, I'm watching the clock, but I could really literally go on for many more hours. Um, two questions uh, just came in. Lexicon and Sanofi LX4211. Um, do you know about this and getting approval in the U.S.? Yeah, I'm trying to think of what a lexicon. I, I, so whoever that is, tell me. I can't remember what that combination. Pickle it flows in. Is oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so this is a really interesting topic. And again, one of the things we've worked in, Steve Edelman, Dr. Edelman, and Pettis and I have talked about this for a long time. Um, is uh, and GDRF has, oh gosh, um, funded this work. I'm just totally blanking out. 
Um, the idea of SGLT inhibition, so this drug is actually an SGLT1 and 2 inhibitor. Um, and these drugs are so powerful in people with type 2 diabetes. And some of you probably have tried SGLT inhibitors, dapagliflozin or empagliflozin, um, that are out on the market and marketed for type 2 diabetes as an adjunct additional therapy to your insulin. And essentially for folks who don't know what this means, these are drugs that lower the renal threshold so you pee out more sugar. So I showed my old uh, test trip, uh, uh, test tape strips because we all know that the original diagnoses of diabetes were, was made by sugar in the urine. And um, that happened at a high level. These drugs lower the level. So why would it only be approved for type two and not type one? And the answer is this phenomenon and risk of what's called euglycemic DKA, which very, very much scares the companies and the FDA. And, 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 and if you're not familiar with euglycemic DKA, what it means is you can get into DKA with what look like normal blood sugar levels. And I'll tell you just a, a real life example of this is one of my friend's son um, was on one of these SGLT inhibitors and was killing it on this drug. Just doing wonderfully. Lost weight, tremendous improvement in his A1C, felt better, life-changing. Well, as he lost weight, he kept lowering his insulin dose and his A1C was coming down and he's losing more weight. He's feeling good. One weekend he got sick and he just said, kept saying to his dad, I feel terrible. I'm throwing up and I don't understand what's going on. And they are like, well, are you ketotic? I don't have strips. Um, finally went to the hospital was in full blown DKA, like 140 blood sugars. So picture that you're peeing out the sugar and you're not reading as having high blood sugar. But remember that DKA isn't caused by high blood sugar. It's caused by low insulin. Your body doesn't have insulin, so it's breaking down protein and fat and, and, and generating ketones. So that's the worry. And I think uh, to, the, to um, uh, Brad's question, um, uh, and 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 or maybe somebody else, Glenn's question, and Brad's pointing out that SGLT1 um, actually does work in the intestine, um, uh, yes, in the lower part of the gut, um, is you, the European regulators and a number of foreign regulators have approved these drugs with, with warnings. If you have type 1 diabetes, you've got to still take your insulin and monitor ketones and be careful. The FDA is wrestling with this. So we've gone in and we've argued that we believe these drugs should be approved. We believe that with proper medical supervision and the right warnings, that the upside outweighs the risk. And the scientist who heads up our research department actually worked on dapagliflozin at BMS back in the day. There, you know, there are all these now complications benefits, cardiovascular benefits. It looks like kidney benefits. So, and you can imagine using it with loop or uh, a, a hybrid closed loop, you're lopping off a lot of the high. So now you can have a really interesting approach to um, less what we would call controller pressure, you know, less of these challenges of the swings. So we hope that they'll be approved with the right, um, uh, right warnings and right education. Okay, um, well, well, maybe end on a political note. Uh, do you care to, or are you interested in commenting on what's happening with the French government regarding the DIY community? I'm not sure that I know. Uh, I, I do know that in my, you know, pre-COVID, I used to travel to Europe a lot. Uh, and there were, so are they cracking down on the DIY community? Is that what's happening? Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you um, a couple of just anecdotes here. Um, in Sweden, they had a big problem for a while. And one of the doctors who I'm friends with, who's a wonderful pediatrician, Ragnar Hannes, 
he and I talked a lot about JDRF, you know, speaking to the Swedish uh, clinicians and regulators because they were threatening parents with child abuse for putting kids. I mean, it was absolutely crazy. So we have been working with our number of our, we actually have two full-time employees in Europe who work with the European Commission on a variety of big diabetes related funding initiatives. But they also work on policies and um, one who just retired is actually based in Paris. So we have been fighting this fight country to country, uh, arguing to the clinical organizations. Many of the European countries have their own clinical organizations. They set their own guidelines. Um, And I don't know if the team is engaged with the French yet, but I'll reach out to our person who just retired. He's still volunteering and doing a lot for JDRF and ask him what's going on. He's very, very tied in to the French regulatory and decision makers. And I'm sure will give me a download and, we, we have been uh, having many of those discussions to try to drive some reason amongst uh, these uh, clinicians. Is there anything we can do as in the DIY community? This is a very, very proactive group of people. Um, and we're now- I think the, do- the donation of data is hugely important. The, you know, the different data donation, whether it's uh, with uh, OpenAPS, uh, uh, Loop, uh, Tidepool, um, Android APS, data talks, you know, um, the way that we've broken through with FDA was data. You know, I can go up there and give as many anecdotes as I want, and that helps a little bit, maybe sometimes people trust that I think I'm being pretty honest and forthright with my, my, you know, my comments. Um, But when you have millions of hours of data and that is where we break through with folks. And uh, you know, we talk about clinical trials, the big discussion with NIH and JDRF and Helmsley and in all of medicine right now, is RCTs are good, randomized controlled trials, but real world data is valuable and tells tremendous stories. And what we've, with the, I I can, you know, you asked me about Tidepool Loop. Tidepool collecting the data and the big study that they did on Loop is going to drive that system out to the market. So along along those lines, um, and we have some people uh, listening in from Europe, in the middle of the night, um, they just launched their study on Open Project um, for everyone on SoCal Loopers. Uh, the link is on our site or look up Open Project. They are collecting data as well. Please, please join their efforts and ask or answer their surveys. That that will help collect this data that you're talking about. That would be wonderful. If there's anything you think we can help you with, uh, I offer you a lot of people. You know, my, my big plea to everybody um, is be diabetes advocates. You know, JDRF has a robust advocacy program. Uh, I know there are people who are critical that we take money from, we partner with the insulin manufacturers and a number of the device manufacturers. You know, each one of the systems on the, that, that's coming to market in the commercial space, JDRF helped fund the development of. The algorithm that's in the tide pools, uh, the, the tandem system, the Medtronic system, the new Omnipod I saw, uh, EASD is this week, the big European diabetes meeting. Uh, Insulet's expecting their home-baked system to be out early next year. That's part of the original grant that we gave to Stanford and UCSB. You know. So I know that people don't like us working with companies, but guess what? The companies, um, we we are fighting the insulin fight. And just like we fought uh, Medtronic trying to box out Tandem and uh, other pumps with United Health Group. While we partner with Medtronic, I can tell you I sat in a room with United Health Group and Medtronic and said, we had, I think, 70,000 letters that went to the CEOs saying that we did not want that policy to stand. And they changed it. 
So, you know, you can throw arrows at me. I and mean, I, I started out by saying I'm a big boy and, and, and I'll, you know, tell it as it is. The reason we work with the companies is to try to drive these innovations. So, um, so being an advocate means getting in front of these issues, whether it's more federal funding, you know, JDRF is a big advocate for the special diabetes program. Tandem system, the pivotal trial was funded by the SDP. Think about that. Advocacy driven made that process happen faster. The original algorithms funded by JDRF and special diabetes program to the tune of millions of dollars. Insulin access, I've t testified on both in front of the Senate and the House. You know, we need affordable insulin. You know, so my, one plea is to become a, uh, an advocate, a JDRF advocate, or you know, fight, fight however you can fight. Um, the other is to, to participate, donate your data, participate in a clinical trial. Now, I would say just get involved. One of my goals at JDRF as the CEO at T1D is to get more T1D adults involved. JDRF began, began as a parent-driven organization. Now we have a number of board members of T1D. We're representative of, we have uh, uh, people who've had diabetes 60, 70 years, um, all ages and all stages. And, you know, so lean in, help how you can. Ride a bike across the United States. Um, uh, Educate uh, your, your local clinicians who need education. I think uh, do a walk, do, get, volunteer and help somebody else who doesn't know about this stuff. Um, I, I, I'm so grateful and I, you know, of course I always want people to support JDRF. I'm a true believer. I, I think we're doing great work and I'm proud that, you know, the, some of the benefits that we're seeing with CGM and these advancements that we've taken part in but so get involved in any way you can and get other people involved. There's so many people sitting on the sidelines. You know, we need a bigger voice. Uh, so that, that's my plea. Totally appreciate every word you've said tonight. Um, I heard you were amazing. You are amazing. Thank you for being there. Uh, again, I've been with JDRF forever. I'm so thrilled to see a T1 involved um really appreciate it and we will we will pass on the the message on advocacy well i'm gonna oh. just end with an amazing story to talk about how awesome this committee is so for the people listening in joanne and i connected and we were talking about doing this and it was amazing because one of literally that morning one of my friends from new york city uh <laughs> his his Riley link died and he was working in Vancouver. And it just speaks to this incredible community. Of course, he hadn't brought his PDM. He, uh, and he will say this, so I don't think I'm uh, outing him, but he's not the most technologically savvy person. I'm usually helping him uh, if he's having in tech, to, you know, tech support. In any case, um, Joanne was able to make a connection to Scotty in Vancouver. They were like six blocks away from one another. He went over, they connected and boom, Victor was back and uh, back on a better, newer version of loop, green lighting and going. So, you know, when you think about the DIY community, night scout community, open APS, Scott, Dana, Lane, Nate, all these you guys, um, it's, it, it, it's an amazing, you all are amazing. So I am honored to be here. Uh, I consider you guys all tremendous T1D champions and friends. And um, I'm grateful there are people like you out fighting the fight because it's helping thousands and ultimately millions of lives. Thank you. I'm close to tears. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I live totally in gratitude to this group, to everything you're doing. Um, thank you. You all have a good evening. We'll Thanks see you again everybody. real soon. See you soon. And hopefully thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.